Welcome, uh, welcome everyone to the part six of the ICU Linguistic Colloquium, uh, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sung Hun Lee from ICU. The topic of uh, this season is African linguistics. Today we have two talks uh, by Dr. Jochen Zeller and his uh, colleagues from University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. Oh, uh, the relative cross was wrong. Uh, uh, Dr. Jochen Zeller is from uh, University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, and he will present uh, uh, his work with his colleagues. And then uh, Dr. Cedric Pateng will uh, present his work uh, uh, in the second part of the uh, colloquium. So let me introduce the first speaker uh, before we listen to his talk. Jochen is an associate professor of linguistics at University of KwaZulu Natal in uh, Durban, South Africa. Jochen is interested in the syntax of natural language, particularly on African languages uh, spoken in uh, South Africa, but not limited to those languages. Uh, he also works on language and cognition, and his recent uh, work appeared in multiple journals uh, like Transactions of the Philosophical Society, Philological Society, Linguistische Berichte, Linguistics, and uh, other places. And his work uh, include object marking, locative inversion, among other different topics. Uh, a new project actually between Japan and South Africa just began in December 2020, just a few months ago. And Jochen is actually part of the South African team. So uh, it's great uh, uh, to have his uh, talk at this colloquium. Uh, he, uh, when I met Jochen and also cross, uh, came across his work uh, uh, in, uh, through articles, uh, I always find his uh, keen observations towards Bantu languages interesting and also his analysis uh, refreshing. And uh, it's good to have uh, his talk uh, at ICU Link today. So Jochen uh, will talk about the parser concerns the lexicon in spite of transparent gender marking, e.g. evidence from noun class agreement processing in Zulu. Uh, this is a joint work with Emmanuel Bilund and Ashley Glenn Lewis. Uh, the first part of the talk will be deliver, delivered by Jochen, and the second part uh, of this talk uh, will be by Ashley, uh, who is um, uh, working at uh, Radboud University in the Netherlands. And he works mostly on cognition and behavior there. So please go ahead. Like, looking forward to the talk. Thank you very much, um, Singun, for this kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. And I hope that it will work so that you can see we what can I see. Can, yeah. can you see the first page now? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So yes, um, so thank you very uh, much again for, for this very warm and kind introduction and for the invitation for giving us uh, the opportunity to talk in this forum a little bit about our research. Um, this is a psycholinguistic research or rather neurolinguistic research. Um, we used a technique called electroencephalography or EEG to examine how the parser responds when it encounters a noun class agreement violation in Zulu. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first study that investigates language processing using EEG with speakers of a Bantu language. So we are quite excited about it and it has been a long project in the making. So um, we're very happy to be able to now present our results. So what we will do is I will begin by talking about uh, this technique a little bit more. I'm assuming that maybe not everyone is familiar with it. So I'll talk about EG and what, it, what we can do with it in studying language processing. And then I'll talk about the overall topic of our research, which is gender and gender agreement. And that, of course, then leads me to uh, a few remarks on noun class in Zulu, um, because obviously noun class can be seen as a gender system. And then I talk about our experiment. Um, I will explain why we think that Zulu can really bring some new insights to the table um, when it comes to uh, questions about language processing and specifically gender agreement. And I will um, explain why we think that is the case and then hand over to my colleague, um, Dr. Lewis, who will then continue by talking a little bit more about um, um, the study, giving some details of um, our methods. He will present the results and then um, talk about how we interpret our results in the discussion section. Okay, so let me begin with a few words about EG and the study of language processing. So 
EEG is basically um, a technique that has been used uh, through, throughout cognitive science in many, many studies for quite a long time now. It measures the electrical activity that is produced by neurons in the brain. So um, neurons communicate electrochemically, so they send electrical impulses to other neurons uh, and then uh, produce chemical reactions that produce more electrical activity. And that activity can be measured by electrodes that are glued to, to the scalp. So what you can basically do in the laboratory, you can give uh, people a cognitive task to perform. And while they perform that task, you measure their electrical activity produced by their, by their brains. And um, then you can link the task performance, particularly the time scale of the task performance to um, the EEG signal. That's basically how this, e, uh, this technique is used. And the most common way of interpreting um, EEG signals is by means of so-called event-related potentials. Um, so these event-related potentials are obtained by averaging across typically many, many different trials of the same kind and often across many different participants as well to basically reduce the EEG signal to one waveform, which is somehow then um, time locked to the actual event that produced the respective EEG activity. And this particular waveform is an event related potential because it can be linked up to, um, to the particular cognitive task. So for example, in language comprehension studies like ours, um, Usually subjects in the laboratory are asked to read sentences on a computer screen word for word while their brain activity is measured. And then we can isolate for each word a component of the ERP wave that can be mapped onto the timing of that particular word. In other words, onto the time for which this word was shown on the screen. And that this can be done in the order of milliseconds. So EG has an excellent temporal resolution and you can um, therefore obtain excellent results about and insights into the timing of certain um, cognitive processes, like for instance, linguistic uh, processing. So typically what happens in, um, in neuro-linguistic studies like, like ours, um, there are comparison made between certain words, target words, words of interest, and uh, the ERP component for that word. Um, and those are compared to ERP components created by the same word when it appears in a sentence where it produces some type of linguistic violation. And then you can compare the two waveforms of the same word once in, when it appeared in a, in a grammatical condition, once when it appeared in an ungrammatical condition. And the, you will see that there is uh, perhaps a, a difference or you know, deflection of the waveform. Um, and that's, a, that's, that's an ERP effect. That's like a specific signature for a particular type of violation that has produced this kind of effect. And in, um, in linguistics, there are three uh, well-established ERP effects. One is called the N400, which is associated more with lexical semantic violations. Um, the second one and the third one are called the LAN and the P600. And those are more relevant for our studies because they are associated with syntactic violations. And I'm going to say a little bit more about them now um, because we predicted that we would find these effects as well in our study, which looked at noun class agreement violations. So the LAN, LAN stands for left anterior negativity, is an effect that is observed about three to 450 milliseconds after the onset of the target word. So after it appears on the screen when someone is reading um, sentences for comprehension. And it's, it's associated with, it's triggered by words that cause morphosyntactic violations like agreement violations. And we have an example here from a, a study which is quite similar to ours in many respects, but it was conducted on German. So, so you, uh, here you see like um, one of the typical stimuli sentences, obviously that would be presented word for word and there would be no color coding. I've just added this here to highlight the, the noun phrase because this study looked at um, gender agreement in the noun phrase. And what you see here um, is that in the word of interest, the target word is uh, in bold. Um, German has a three-way gender distinction between masculine, feminine, and neuter gender. So this word Land is neuter gender and, and could appear in a grammatical sentence when it follows a determiner that is also specified for neuter. But then in another stimulus sentence, the same word would appear following a masculine gender and that would uh, a determiner with masculine gender. And that would produce a gender agreement violation. 
And so this is where um, one is interested now by looking at many different trials of the same kind, uh, comparing grammatical uh, conditions with ungrammatical conditions. And when we look at the ERP for this, so this is now the ERP corresponding to the target word, so something like land in the grammatical condition, this is the, the solid line and the ungrammatical condition, um, the dotted line. What you see here is on the x-axis, this would be time. Um, so here would be the onset of the word land on the screen, for example. The y-axis is amplitude and negativity is typically plotted upwards. So that's negative up, uh, amplitude upwards. And when you now compare these two waveforms, you see that at around 350 milliseconds about, there is a deflection, a negative deflection that is um, associated with that um, gender disagreement condition. And that's the land because it's an increase in negative amplitude. That's why it's called a negativity effect. And left anterior refers to the fact that this effect is most prominently observed with um, left anterior frontal electrode. So F3 is the name of an electrode that would be sitting um, uh, further in front of the brain on the, on the left side. So here we have a particular signature ERP effect associated with morphosyntactic violations like this gender agreement violation. That's the LAN effect. There is a second effect that is also associated with syntactic violations, which is known as the P600. So P stands for positive. So this is a positive deflection, positive increase of positive amplitude happening a little bit later in the signal. But importantly, it's caused by agreement violations as well, but by uh, other types of syntactic violations also. So you have um, all kinds of syntactic uh, arrows cause a P600, sometimes even grammatical sentences, which are which require more uh, processing complexity because the sentences are um, maybe more difficult to parse, like sense, uh, center embedding or something like this also can cause a P600. And the effect uh, shows up a little bit later in the signal and therefore has been interpreted as uh, showing slightly different um, processes. It's more associated with uh, uh, mental processes of repair and revision or late syntactic integration. Now, I, leave, I left this example here because obviously um, a gender agreement violation is also the type of syntactic violation that would cause a P600. So um, you get the P600 and the LAN typically together. So here you see that the same violation would also cause a P600. And you see it's a bit later that the, the um, dotted line deflects from the solid line here and it's a positive deflection. That's why it's a P600. And it's found with different electrodes. So this is a, a midline parietal electrode. Some electrodes would show the LAN and the P600 in the same waveform. Um, so typically these agreement violations uh, trigger what's called a biphasic effect, meaning they trigger both the LAN and the P600. Um, the P600 is more robust. So that's really found in the vast majority of agreement studies. The LAN uh, is sometimes not attested, but typically typical um, agreement violations in these kinds of studies show the LAN and the P600. Okay, so, so much about ERPs. There is another way of, of interpreting the EEG signal. Remember that with ERPs, you're averaging across doesn't do that. Um, it's called a time frequency analysis. And this analysis measures event related changes in the um, neural activity, which is signaled by power changes in the EEG signal, power changes in specific frequency bands. So these power changes are taken to reflect changes in the synchronization of neural clusters. And um, you can then look at this EEG signal as a whole, specific, identify specific frequency bands and see what happens with the strength of the signal, the power associated with the signal. And as with ERPs, there are certain effects that have been characteristically associated with syntactic violations. So um, first of all, they tri typically trigger a decrease in, in alpha, in power in alpha and beta frequency bands and an increase in the theta frequency band. So increase in power in the theta band, decrease in power in the alpha band and or beta band. And those are typical signatures uh, of the time frequency analyses for syntactic violations. And to give you an example here as well, this is from a study that um, Ashley conducted with colleagues a couple of years ago on Dutch. Again, it, uh, amongst other things, they tested for gender agreement violations. So uh, here you see a similar setup. Um, Dutch has 
two genders, neuter in common. So hot uh, is a neuter noun. So when it is grammatical, then it follows a neuter determiner hat. But it can also follow um, an, an ungrammatical um, determiner, common gender determiner de, producing the ungrammatical condition. And now, again, um, uh, looking at many different trials of this sort, you get these time frequency analyses and uh, representations. And just to explain how these work, so again, you have time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, you have frequency. So the when you look at these little boxes here, um, the horizontal lines of these boxes basically identify a particular frequency band. Here, it's, it's roughly the beta frequency range. Um, I think the region of interest here was a little bit narrower than that. Um, and then you have like the box identifying a particular frequency band in a certain time window. And importantly, the colors signal the power. So when you have a red color, it's quite, the signal is quite hot. So that's a lot of power. In comparison, now this is for the correct stimulus for a target word appearing in a grammatical sentence. But when the same target word would appear in an incorrect condition, like in the second sentence, then you see within that time window, in that frequency band, that there is less power. So the color has changed to a colder um, color, versus, uh, basically in, in, uh, signaling this, this decrease in power in the beta power range. And that's a particular signature uh, effect found with syntactic violations in these time frequency analyses. OK, so much by way of introduction to the technique we've been using. Now I want to talk about uh, what motivated our study, I talk about gender and gender agreement. Now, what are gender features? Um, they are uninterpretable, meaning that gender classifications are typically arbitrary. There's no link between the gender of a noun in languages that have gender distinctions and meaning. There are some exceptions. Some languages have, for instance, um, bio biological sex reflected in, in gender distinctions. Um, in Bantu languages, you have uh, specific gender classes for human nouns, but particularly with inanimate nouns, um, it's generally agreed that um, gender is an arbitrary feature. Famous example, the word for ocean in German is neuter, in French, it's feminine, and in Italian, it's masculine. Um, these are clearly cognates, but they have different gender, so it's completely arbitrary. And gender is therefore a lexical feature. It has to be learned with the lexical entry of a noun. It's associated with the noun's lemma in the lexicon. And that means when the parser needs to retrieve a gender feature when during language comprehension, it has to probably access the noun's lexical entry to reliably retrieve the gender feature of a noun. That makes gender different from another uh, important feature that also features, <laughs> excuse the pun, um, in agreement relations in the world languages, that's number. So gender is an intrinsic feature. It's intrinsic, intrinsic to the lexical entry. In contrast, number features are extrinsic. They're not associated with the lexical entry per se. They are added to nouns in the morphosyntax. It's in, by, usually with an inflectional morphology. So they're formally, nouns are formally marked for particular plural um, or singular features. And therefore, number features are probably also retrieved in a slightly different way to which I will return. So. Um, this is uh, gender versus number. Now, having said that gender is a lexical feature, there are nevertheless languages which mark gender also through word form. And um, that's well known, for example, for the Romance languages, where uh, in languages like Spanish and or Italian, many of the nouns in the lexicon are what's called gender transparent, meaning that they are marked for their lexical gender in the word, word form. So famously in Spanish, Nouns ending in O are typically masculine. Nouns ending in R are typically feminine. So you can almost read off the gender of the noun by just looking at this, this word marker here. Um, now, having said that there are gender transparent nouns, and in fact, the majority of nouns is gender transparent in romance, there is still a significant proportion of nouns that are not gender transparent. So it's about one third of the lexicon of Spanish and Italian uh, consists of non-transparent nouns. These nouns can be completely irregular in the sense that, for instance, there are nouns ending in R that are masculine and not feminine. Um, or they can be what's called opaque nouns in the sense that they don't reveal their gender through their word form. So it's el sol, masculine, la col, um, feminine. So that's a significant part of the nominal lexicon. It's about a third of nouns. So um, therefore, um, the transparency of the gender system as a whole is, is not, um, does not uh, comprise the whole 
norm in the lexicon, which is an important point to which I will turn when I motivate uh, why we did our study on Zulu. Okay, a big question um, though that has um, come out of this observation that there are gender transparent and non-transparent nouns is whether this kind of gender transparency, the, the kind of formal marking of the gender in the word form does in any way affect agreement processing. And in order to illustrate this question a bit more, I wanna present a model that we have used as a sort of framework also in our study. Um, it's a model, a processing model by Fosa and colleagues, which um, is about lexical retrieval during sentence comprehension. And according to this model, lexical retrieval uh, happens in stages that lead to particular states. So the first stage would be the stage of lexical access when um, the parser locates the correct lexical entry of a particular word. That leads to the state of lexical identification. The next stage is readout. And this is where formal features that are added to the morphosyntax would be processed, including categorical features of the, of the noun, but also features like number, for instance. So we already have in that model two different sources where gender and number information comes in. Gender would probably be identified at this level through lexical access. Number features are extrinsic to the lexical item and would therefore be identified at the readout stage. The last uh, stage is evaluation. So once the features and properties of the noun have been identified, then um, the noun can be sort of integrated into its syntactic con context where agreement relations with other words that have already been processed are established. And now for sign colleagues make an important claim about what happens when the parser encounters an agreement violation at that stage. According to uh, Fossard and colleagues, the parser would then have to return to earlier states in the model to check where it has gone wrong, basically, or if it has gone wrong in identifying the features of a particular word that caused an agreement violation. And then it has to repeat some of these stages, um, depending on where how far it went back. And crucially, how far in the model the parser goes back when encountering an agreement violation depends on the type of feature that has caused the violation. So they argue that when the parser encounters a gender agreement violation, it will have to go back all the way to the state of lexical identification. Because remember, gender is a lexical feature. It can only reliably be accessed through the lexical entry. And therefore, the parser has to basically return and then repeat these stages when there was a gender agreement violation. In contrast, number being an extrinsic feature processed at that stage, the parser would only have to return to the state of lexical recognition in this case, because that would be sufficiently far enough to see whether the number features have been correctly identified, given that number is formally marked on the noun. And so there are different kind of recovery uh, strategies for the parser, depending on what kind of feature causes an agreement uh, uh, violation. And that's confirmed in their study. They have a behavioral psycholinguistic study where they find uh, um, differences in the response to these violations that they take as support for, for these assumptions. Now, we could now ask an interesting question. What about those nouns in Romance languages that are gender transparent? That means they also mark the gender on the word form. And wouldn't it be reasonable to, to argue that maybe in those with these nouns, the um, parser does not have to return to the lexical identification state? Maybe the parser then also only has to return to the state of lexical recognition because after all the word form of those words is also revealed, um, it also reveals the gender. So these, these words may behave like number violations. In other words, when transparent, um, gender transparent nouns trigger agreement violations, these kinds of violations may trigger the same response as number violations. And some studies have looked into this question. They have tried to see if there are differences in the responses. Um, to agreement violations with transparent as opposed to non-transparent nouns in Romance languages. And I'll be quoting a couple of studies here. And the crucial insight is that it doesn't seem to be the case that transparency matters in these languages for recovery from an agreement violation. In other words, um, these, these authors found in their studies, they also did EEG studies, they found that the gender agreement violations would trigger the LAN effect and the P600 that I mentioned earlier. But importantly, they didn't see a difference in, say, the amplitude of these effects or the timing of these effects that would depend on whether the, the noun that caused gender agreement violation was transparent or not. And they conclude from this that even 
in languages with transparent gender marking like the Romance languages on some nouns, the parser will always have to return to the lexical identification state. And they say this is because in Romance languages, there are just too many non-transparent nouns. So the parser cannot adopt a strategy that relies on word form because there are just too many nouns that would contradict or not allow the possibility of retrieving gender through the word form. And therefore, it's almost like calibrated in these languages um, so that it would always go back to the lexical identification state. And this is now where our study comes in. This is where we made the following hypothesis. We, we assume that if there is a language with a more transparent formal system of gender marking, where gender is much more reliably marked throughout the whole nominal lexicon, then we could predict that here maybe the parser will only have to return to the state of lexical recognition when detecting a gender agreement violation because it can use formal marking on nouns as a guide to the gender and to establish gender agreement relations. So here we would expect basically that not only number violations force the parser to return only to the state of lexical recognition, but also gender violations. And we claim that the Bantu language Zulu is such a language with a gender system that is transparent enough to allow us to test this hypothesis. And therefore, I want to say a few things about noun class in Zulu. So it's a common assumption. I think we can call it the standard view that in Bantu, noun class is a combination of gender and number features. Um, so for example, Vicky Carstens has suggested that noun class is essentially a gender system and that noun class prefixes in Bantu realize um, gender specific number features. To illustrate this with an example from Zulu, we have a table here. And what you see is you could take the, the this is the first 11 noun classes of Zulu, and you could um, classify them according to six genders labeled A to F. And then in each gender class, you have um, a singular and a plural, and those are the traditional noun classes. When you now look at the Zulu examples, you can see that in Zulu, you have the noun stem, and then you have, as in all Bantu languages, a noun class prefix. And in Zulu, you also get an initial vowel, a pre-prefix, which um, together with the noun class prefix that could be called the noun class marker. And if you look at these noun class markers, they pretty uniquely already give you a, a strong cue to the noun class of the noun. Okay, so in most cases, you can identify already the noun class of the noun by just looking at the noun class marker. There is some syncretism. So for instance, singular class uh, A and singular class B are both the noun plus marker is um. But importantly, in this case, the dependent elements, the elements that agree with the noun are also almost e exclusively the same. And we, I show this here in this column with a distal demonstrative for these noun classes, because those were the stimuli that we used uh, in our experiment. So those are uh, determiner elements. And you see that umfundi is taking the same determiner as umbuso. And that means basically that the form of the dependent elements can be uniquely identified based on the form of the noun class marker in Zulu. So that's the key insight about Zulu, which we think makes it a perfect language to examine this hypothesis. By the way, this assumption or this observation is already quite old. Um, it goes back all the way to Doak. So this quote here is from a more recent edition of a book that was first published in 1927, where he observes that the form of the noun prefix decides what shall be the form of the different agreeing dependent elements. So that's, that's really an observation about Zulu, which has been made um, in very early, by very, very early Bantuists. And I think it's important that because of that um, property of Zulu, with the vast majority, if not all nouns in Zulu, gender agreement relations can be evaluated on the basis of formal marking alone. And that's the key um, empirical property of Zulu that we use as the basis for our experiment. So what we did in our experiment is we also did um, an EEG study to compare the electrophysiological responses to noun class agreement violations, which are either gender violations, i.e. they are caused by a clear violation of, uh, by a clear gender mismatch. And we compared those to noun class agreement violations, which were unambiguously violations of number. Yeah. And our hypothesis was that both gender and number noun class agreement violation can be detected on the basis of formal cues in Zulu. And therefore, in both cases, the parser returns only to the state of lexical recognition. And our prediction was, therefore, that we would find that the classical um, ERP effects associated um, 
with with uh, gender agreement violations, LAN and P six hundred, and the, the 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 standard TFR time frequency res uh, representation responses, um, namely the decrease in alpha beta power and increase in theta power. But we did not expect that we'd find a significant difference between the, these effects depending on whether the noun class violation was a gender violation or a number violation. So that was our, our basis. And we tested this, um, as I mentioned earlier, by producing sentences with noun phrases that included a pre-nominal distal demonstrative determiner and the followed by a noun. And then we designed our stimuli so that there were grammatical sentences and ungrammatical sentences where there were noun class agreement violations. And we made sure, and that was an important part of, of the preparation of the stimuli, we made sure that the noun class violation was either unambiguously a gender violation or unambiguously a number violation. So when we con constructed a, a gender violation, we made sure that the target noun would follow a demonstrative from a different gender class, but with the same number specification. So that it was clearly gender was the violating feature. And for number, the same thing, we made sure that the demonstrative would belong to the same gender class as the noun, but have the incorrect number specification. So to show a quick example here um, of our stimuli. So in the first sentence, that would be a grammatical sentence. And here's the noun phrase in green. And gray is class nine. So that's gender E singular. And uh, it's grammatical when it follows a, a gender E singular demonstrative layo the corresponding gender violation condition would now have the demonstrative lelo, which is class five. Now, importantly, class five is also a singular noun class. So lelo is unambiguously also singular. So the number specification is the same as the target noun, but the, the mistake, the noun class violation is produced by a gender mismatch. Same for number here, leso zicha, both class eight, that's gender D plural. That's grammatical. We change this in the ungrammatical number violation condition by using the singular demonstrative of that gender class D, that's class seven. So we kept gender constant, but changed the demonstrative um, into the um, diff incorrect number specification. Okay, that's my part. I'm gonna stop sharing and I hand over now to um, Dr. Lewis. Okay, let me share my slides. And I think you should be seeing the right version. Is that correct? Not the um, presenter mode, but the regular slides. Yes, yes we can see the slides. Yeah. Actually. Wonderful, thanks. Okay, so Jochen did a really beautiful job uh, setting up the study and telling you about the stimuli that we used. And so, um, those are the kinds of sentences that people were reading, and these were presented to people uh, on the screen in the center, one word at a time in the so-called uh, rapid serial visual presentation uh, mode, where the words were on the screen for 500 milliseconds with a blank screen in between for, for 300 milliseconds. It's a standard way of presenting these kinds of stimuli. We also had um, so-called yes-no comprehension questions in the, in the experiment. Um, this is mainly just to check that people were paying attention and they were reading and understanding what they were reading correctly. We also had a language background questionnaire that we can talk about a bit later. And then importantly, while people were reading these sentences, we measured their EEG and that looks a little bit like this uh, when they're sitting there um, doing their reading. And these are the kinds of signals that we get out of the EEG. So you get these kind of waveforms. And then we do this epoching of the data around the target word, which remember is the, the noun in this case. Um, and the noun, remember, either fits or mismatches with the preceding demonstrative determiner. And then we, we basically just did the standard kind of pre-processing that you would do for EEG and the standard sort of artifact removal and attenuation for the data. Then we split the data into epochs uh, separately for each of the conditions. So the gender correct, the gender violation, the number correct, and the number violation conditions. And then to get our dependent measures um, for the ERPs, we do basically this baseline correction and event-related averaging within each of the conditions. That gives us our ERP waveforms that we then com compare in the statistics. For the time frequency analysis, uh, we use a short time Fourier transform with a sliding hand window to get moving estimates of the spectral content uh, across the time axis. Um, and 
for the statistics, we use this cluster-based permutation approach. And this is a nice way of handling the so-called multiple comparisons problem because we're testing multiple time points, multiple frequency bins, and multiple electrodes. So you could potentially inflate the false alarm rate, um, but this is handled very nicely under the cluster-based permutation framework. Um, you can ask more about the details of these analyses in the discussion if you're interested uh, in getting into the nitty gritty. Um, so then let me move on to present some results. So first the ERPs, this is what we have. Um, so what you're seeing here is now negativity is plotted up. Uh, um, I'm not sure if that was mentioned before. And zero is the onset of the target word. And so you can see in this time window between about 400 and 600 milliseconds, a more negative going waveform for the violations compared to the correct condition. And so in this first analysis, we analyzed main effects and interaction effects. So that's irrespective of, of the gender type. And then if we found main effects and interaction effects, we split it up into gender and number separately. And so having observed this main effect, uh, which has the following topography, this kind of uh, frontal, potentially slightly left lateralized topography for this negative difference. And this is the difference when you take violation minus the correct condition. Uh, so this is really nice, clear, more negative going waveform in that time window with this frontal distribution that allows us to identify this as a, a clear instance of the LAN or, or the left anterior negativity. And so then if you split it up according to uh, the agreement type, then this is what you get. So for number, you get this very nice clear effect with a sustained uh, more negative going uh, waveform for the violations. Uh, for gender, you get the same effect, but it's much more short-lived and uh, you would say a bit reduced compared to, to the number of violations. Um, and it's a little bit more clearly visible if you look at the topographies of the effects. So you've already seen the main effect. Here we have the difference violation minus correct for the gender condition and for the number condition. And you can see again for number, it's very widespread um, and a little bit more blue. So it's a stronger effect. Whereas here it's a slightly weakened effect and it's a little bit more restricted to the left anterior uh, electrodes for gender. So while both gender and number are showing this LAN effect, um, there's a qualitative difference uh, between gender and number, which suggests maybe they're not behaving exactly the same. Um, and so the LAN is, uh, as Jochen has said, is typically thought to reflect something like an automatic detection of amorphous syntactic violation. And so since we have a more pronounced LAN for the number violation condition, that may suggest we want to claim that uh, since number is the sole source of agreement confirmation or disconfirmation, that might explain why the signal is, is maybe more important or more prominent for, for number. Whereas with gender, um, you can also check the agreement via this, uh, the lemma or the, the, um, the lexical entry, so via the noun, noun stem. And so that may explain why we get a slightly uh, reduced effect for the LAN in this case. Um, okay, so then moving on to the time frequency results, um, I'm going to show you number first. So now what you're looking at, just to remind you, is time and frequency uh, on the, on the y-axis. Um, and these black boxes are showing you the regions where we actually see an effect in the data. Uh, so we get something in the alpha and the beta range all the way from about 8 to around 22 hertz, starting around, I think, three or 400 milliseconds, you would say. And then what you can see very clearly for the violation, you get a more pronounced decrease, so a more blue patch here compared to correct for the number of violations. Uh, and we get something very similar for gender. Um, so again, uh, this patch is more blue, so that you get a larger desynchronization for, for the gender violations compared to the gender correct uh, condition at the target word. Um, and you can see this a bit more clearly if you look at the differences. So the differences show this is now correct minus violation show these kind of uh, very clear differences in this in this window. And I think it's probably the easiest to see in these waveforms, which now average over the, uh, the frequency bin here, all the frequency bins. Uh, and you can see this clear desynchronization for the violation condition, uh, which is more pronounced compared to the correct condition in green. Um, it's even more kind of, um, pronounced if you look at, sorry, more prominent if you look at the number condition, sorry, if you look at the topographies, 
Um, so now what you're looking at is um, in the two rows, an early and a later time window. And here for the correct and the violation conditions, and then their difference, correct minus violation. So you could focus here on the difference. And you can see the number effect in this alpha and beta range is really reflected on the occipital electrodes. So towards the back of the head, and these are over regions that are of the brain that are ostensibly linked to visual processing or processing visual features. Um, which fits very nicely with the idea that in, in the case of number, you're checking uh, the uh, visual word form or the formal marking on the noun, the noun class prefix, um, when you're encountering an agreement violation. Um, with gender, on the other hand, although these two effects looked very similar when we look at the time course and the frequency bins, if you look at the topography, suddenly we don't see this over the occipital electrodes, we see instead a frontal uh, difference uh, in both of the time windows, um, suggesting that number and gender actually are behaving quite differently. And in the case of gender, maybe the parser doesn't rely as much on these uh, formal features. Um, so we wanted to confirm that there is indeed this uh, difference between uh, these uh, posterior electrodes and the frontal electrodes. So uh, we did, um, we extracted the power values in these two regions for each condition separately, for each gender type separately. And we entered these into a, a mixed effects model. Um, and for the aficionados, this is uh, more or less the formula, but basically the most interesting thing here is that we wanted to look for a condition by agreement type by region of interest uh, interactions. So this would be uh, gender and number, uh, correct and violation, and then frontal and posterior region. And that would be what we would expect to find to confirm that we indeed have this difference between frontal and posterior electrodes for the difference between correct and violation for the difference between the gender types. Um, and you can ask more about the details later if you're interested. And so this is what we get. Um, for those who are not used to reading these kinds of plots, we have here for each of the predictors in the model, an estimate of the uh, marginal posterior distribution. Uh, and uh, in these posteriors, the yellow regions are marking the so-called 95% credible interval. And if this is zero point, so the dotted line falls outside of that 95% credible interval, then uh, the observation is highly unlikely to be by chance. So that means it's a significant uh, predictor in the models. Uh, and so you can see for our three-way interaction here, we do get a, a significant effect, which tells us that there is a difference between the frontal and the posterior electrodes. Um, and so, yeah, just to wrap up this section, um, alpha and beta power have in the past, in previous work, been linked to something like dynamically engaging underlying neural networks, especially when a particular type of information needs to be processed and, and then the, the, the system knows this. Uh, and people have suggested that these desynchronizations may be reflected to something like updating working memory representations. So if you think about our number violations, um, we have these effects over the posterior electrodes. And this actually, if you think about it in this framework, makes a lot of sense um, because the visual word form information is really the most important or relevant when you're checking, when you encounter an agreement violation, that, that's, that's a number agreement violation. Whereas with gender, we get these effects over the frontal electrodes and that suggests that it might not be the case that in Zulu, the, 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 the visual word form information is being used. Uh, the parser seems to, even though it, the word form information is, is a reliable cue, it seems to still uh, consult the, the noun class prefix. It, it seems to, sorry, still consult the lexicon or the lexical entry. I'm just looking at the time to see whether I should go into very much detail. But basically, um, we also had an unpredicted effect in the data, which was an early P1 effect um, for the gender condition only, but not for the number condition. Um, and if you think about it in the, in the context of this model that uh, Jochen was presenting, this actually does make quite a lot of sense uh, because the timing fits really well. So P1 is a very early effect and this lexical access stage is a very early stage of the processing model. Um, so uh, if gender is, is uh, driving this effect, uh, the gender mismatch is driving this effect, then it makes just sense that it fits this early stage of the model. And it also makes sense that we don't find the effect for number because uh, the number information is only like um, accessible later in a later processing stage. Um, I'm going to, well, let me just talk very briefly about this. 
so basically we predicted that if that is the case, then um, our P1 effect should show a relationship with the LAN. So the idea being that people who show a very, like people who show a larger P1 effect um, because they've already accessed the gender information may show a reduced LAN effect because they no longer need to make use of the morphosyntactic marking uh, on, the, on the noun. Uh, and so this is what we find. We find this kind of moderate relationship when we do a Spearman correlation. Uh, and so the larger the P1, the smaller the LAN effect, uh, which is a really nice finding. Um, I'm gonna skip this part because it's something I've more or less already said. Um, just to mention that we don't find any P600 effects and we don't find any theta power differences. There was no evidence for either of those. And if you're interested, you can ask about that in the discussion uh, section, uh, question and answer session. Um, but here, just to, to kind of uh, put everything together. Uh, so you'll remember Jochen gave you these two uh, possibilities for how the parser might behave when it encounters an agreement violation, spe specifically a gender agreement violation. Uh, the kind of traditional view has been that the parser has to go back to the state of lexical identification. Uh, whereas with number, it can go back just to the state of recognition. And we had hypothesized that maybe in the case of a language where um, the gender marking is reliable, it may be the case that the parser can take this one less step and go back to the state of recognition, as in this case. And so that was our hypothesis for Zulu. And so we can look at our results in the context of uh, these two possibilities. And so I think what we have here is some very clear evidence that gender and number behave differently, uh, at least qualitatively. And so that's, I think, clear evidence against uh, our hypothesis. So it reduces. And we also have from the ERPs this very nice relationship between an early P1 effect where the parser seems to access the gender information. And that leads to a reduction in, this, in the uh, uh, the error signal based on the morphosyntax. And I think that can also be taken as evidence against this hypothesis. So it also decreases again. But then I think the final piece of evidence that really uh, drives this all home is this topographical difference in the power, the alpha and beta power, where the number effect fits very clearly with something that would be related to the visual processing or the processing of the, uh, the visual word form information. Whereas the gender effect seems to be a more top-down controlled potentially access to the lexicon. And I think that again, provides evidence against that hypothesis. So just to conclude, um, we have evidence, I think that in a language with a highly regular formal marking of gender, uh, the agreement, sorry, gender agreement, the parser nevertheless still consults the lexicon when encountering an agreement violation. And so it's the first study on Ubuntu language, which is great, but Beyond that, uh, even though it's an understudied language, I think it also offered us an, a, a really like unique opportunity uh, to test a really important hypothesis in in the psycholinguistics literature that wouldn't have been able to wouldn't have been possible to test with some of the more popular languages that have been used uh, in the literature in the past. And I think we're just about in time, so that's everything I had to say, and I'm going to stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jochen, and thank you, Ashley, for interesting talk, uh, for an interesting talk about uh, EEG results. I think we may have some questions already. Uh, anybody who has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, first, uh, Cedric, and then uh, Pokumaro Sensei. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this really, really interesting talk. I have many questions. Um, I'll start with the uh, um, first one, and uh, we'll see if I have time to ask for the others. Um, so there, was, there, are, there are cases where um, uh, in Bantu languages, I don't know if it's the case in Zulu, you have a difference when animacy is involved. Uh, some nouns of uh, class 9, 10 can agree in one, two uh, for humans of, of these classes, for instance. Uh, oh, is it the case? Is it the case in Zulu or not? And do you expect something different from your results in such a case? I hope I was clear. Um, thank you very much, Cedric. That's uh, an important point. So 
first to answer for Zulu, that's something that Zulu does not have. Um, I'm aware that in many languages, when you have a human noun in class 9, 10, that you can get class 1, 2 agreement. And um, Zulu also has some human nouns in noun class 9. Um, but crucially, does not then allow for the use of the class 1 and 2 um, agreement markers. And that's exactly why, I, why we think Zulu maybe more than other Bantu languages allows us for to, to, to test our hypothesis because it is really the form of the noun um, that tells us what kind of agreement to take. So semantic, a semantic agreement um, does not allow us to override this kind of more syntactic formal agreement in Zulu. Um, the bigger question is, of course, to what extent the, the, uh, this, the system of noun class agreement is transparent in the sense that you can establish agreement relations only on the basis of the form of the noun. And that was also a question that we thought about uh, and what it means for the parser to be um, to use this potentially different strategy. Um, and it's, I mean, I don't want to go into too many details, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite as easy as saying that um, the gender of, of or noun class of each noun is always uniquely identified by the form. There are these um, syncretisms and um, an additional problem for our, for our stimuli was that when you, when you um, have a pre-nominal demonstrative, then the initial vowel drops away. And therefore you get some noun classes that have zero noun class prefixes where you can no longer identify the noun class solely on the uh, basis of the form when it follows the demonstrative. So we left, for instance, these types of nouns we didn't use in our stimuli. Um, but what we still believe to be the case is that overall, these, these, these noun classes are typically noun class 11 and noun class 1a that are causing these problems. And in terms of the contribution to the nominal system, they are a minor and um, the overall noun class system in Zulu is, is very transparent. And we think that this overall transparency, the fact that really noun class is marked um, and pretty much a reliable cue in most cases, that this is responsible for the parser of a Zulu speaker to be calibrated um, to use potentially a different strategy when establishing these agreement relations. Um, and that's that's a, that's a, I, I, I think is is pretty um, pretty strong. Our evidence did not support our hypothesis, so it seems that even though that is the case, that the parser still um, discovers or reevaluates gender agreement violations by taking into account the lexical entry of the noun. So um, even though the form would be a reliable reliable cue, so that was an unexpected um, finding that. Um, we, we hadn't expected to find these significant differences. I hope this answers your question, Cedric. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, next, uh, Tokumaru Sensei. Yes. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. Hello. Uh, uh, I submitted my paper two years ago. Uh, to Salaris, KwaZulu Natal University. But that conference was canceled. <laughs> it was a very unfortunate. I was with a uh, Japanese anthropologist, uh, Shima, uh, because uh, in two years, it is 100 years anniversary of uh, Raymond Dart, Dr. Raymond Dart's uh, discovery of uh, Australopithex Africanus. And it is coming. So. It, it was very sad. Uh, my question is, uh, this is the first time to see Zulu specialist, a very simple one. How many syllables do Zulu have? Uh, do, do you mean syllable types or do you yes. mean uh, still, uh, 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 so, okay. Like whether you can have CV or CVC or that kind of type, right? Yeah, yes, that's yes. the question. Right? And how, 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 how many in total? In Japanese, the Japanese syllables are 112. So uh -huh. how many consonants, how many vowels, and how many syllables? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. So you have um, 
I'm not sure if it's about the noun class marker where you always have a vowel element as, as the augment and then the noun class prefix is CV. But but if you're asking me about the whole range of possible yes, for, CV for example, combinations. Japanese have 112, about 112. And English, 5,000, 8,000. So different. Uh, mm -hmm. The number of syllables uh, differs language by language. So my question is about well, Bantu languages. but uh, in particular, how many syllables in Zulu language? I'm afraid I can't answer this. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know. Uh, how many vowels? How many consonants? Maybe maybe Zingun would be a better person to answer yeah, this for uh, some of the South African Bantu languages. Yes, uh, uh, it's probably not directly connected to the talk. Uh, so, uh, but uh, if depending on the languages you can have 40 to 50 consonants and uh, five vowels so when you do the uh, math then maybe you can have that but that doesn't mean that you have uh, uh, only those five vowels uh, depending on the languages uh, you can also have seven vowels like that's uh, allophonic so it really will depend on what your definition is of uh, do you do you want to have a phonemic contrast uh, or not but uh, since it's not uh, uh, since it, this is not directly related to the EED uh, work uh, so uh, maybe we can uh, move on uh, uh, even though it was an interesting question about uh, the Zulu language uh, uh, thank you <laughs> so thank you uh, yeah uh, so anybody else I have a yeah, well, maybe before Cedric, I will ask the question. <laughs> uh, in your stimuli, I think uh, you used uh, uh, the uh, demonstrative uh, noun word order. And uh, sometimes people usually say that uh, in Bantu languages, it's the noun, uh, the demonstrative actually follows the noun. And once it precedes the noun, there's some kind of uh, uh, focus effect or like strengthening effect uh, of that distal uh, demonstrative and uh, I was wondering whether uh, you had any uh, thoughts about uh, that uh, particular stimuli maybe it's just the one that we saw uh, that had that particular word order but uh, whether that uh, uh, had any effect or yeah, like uh, whether it was by design or, or why you chose that uh, uh, non-default word order for that uh, particular area, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't think it's a non-default word or a word order. I think in, oh, I in, think. Uh, in Guni pre-nominal demonstratives, I think it's the default. Um, so that's typically how where people place the, the demonstrative um, mm -hmm. in the default sort of translation for this dog or that man or something like this. I think I so see. there are effects, I th I, to the best of my knowledge, these effects are more associated with the post nominal order that you get focus effects, but um, the pre nominal order is uh, unmarked. Oh, that's to the best of my knowledge. That's yeah. really interesting because in Shitsonga and Chivenda, it's the opposite. Uh, uh, oh, the, really? Yeah, the mm -hmm. uh, pre, pre nominal demonstratives get a focus and also slightly more penultimate lengthening than the uh, post nominal uh, demonstratives. So uh, it would be interesting whether that kind of effect may be found. But I don't I don't think uh, for this particular study, it, it will definitely matter. So, so. I think it could be yeah, a really I mean, interesting also... follow. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was sorry just going to say, I think it could be a really interesting follow up, actually, because um, I was not aware of that. But there is some work in the EEG literature suggesting that when you do place elements into focus like this, it serves to draw people's attention towards that target word. Uh, so you get reduced uh, N400 and P600 effects when the element is out of focus compared to when it's in focus. Uh, so, you know, we have these absent P600 effects, for instance, that could be something interesting to, to play around with and see if you put it into focus, suddenly you see mm -hmm. something like that. Right. right. And it seems like a nice uh, uh, asymmetry between uh, uh, Tonga and Zulu, actually, which one is focus, which order is the focus word order or not. So you can test. When you, when you say focus, what exactly, is focused. Uh, uh, so when, when you say something like a uh, demonstrative noun, like this dog, uh, that word order, it means like it's this dog, not, not any not other one. one. It's an exclusive one, but like 
when you just say like a uh, dog this it can be like like you are not making anything exclusive you are just like uh look at uh, uh yeah uh here's a here's this dog or like uh, this dog uh, ate something and but we don't know whether other dogs ate something or not but if you use the word order this dog then it's only mm -hmm. this dog ate uh, uh, the dog food whereas mm -hmm. uh, a dog this is like yes this dog ate it but like other dog could have ate it dogs could have eaten yeah 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 so that kind of difference is, is being represented yeah. so as far as far as i know the the unmarked order is the the pre-nominal demonstrative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but i mean yeah ashley is right i mean that would be an interesting follow up um so the focus is on the basically it's a way of mark focus marking contrastive focus on the whole noun phrase by changing mm -hmm. the word order right that's mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think and, and uh, I don't know, um Singwood, <laughs> you asked about so our stimuli were designed, so we could we we had to following uh, other studies that also looked at gender agreement in the noun phrase, we deliberately looked for um nouns directly following a pre-nominal determiner, and given mm -hmm. the absence of uh, articles, we we used demonstratives and we used um, distal demonstratives because um, the the proximal demonstratives are sometimes monosyllabic and sometimes bisyllabic in, in Zulu. And we wanted to avoid um, this kind of um, difference. So we wanted to make sure that all our determiners are bisyllabic. So we went for the distal ones. Yes. And, and obviously, this, the, the yeah, as far as I know, the distals I have all the same tonal pattern as well, actually. They're all high, low. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, hmm. I mean, not that I don't. I mean, that would be another interesting question. You know, how how do how does tone affect language comprehension through reading? Um, mm -hmm. Given that that in normal reading in our stimuli, the tone was not marked. So um, you know that. But um, what else? What 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 was I going to say? Yeah. So the the stimuli were also there were the sentences were all constructed obviously by by Zulu nat native speakers and they were vetted by many other Zulu speakers. So it was um, we, we we had a much larger pool of stimuli sentences initially and then reduced them more and more to to really get those that were sounding most natural. That you know so i.e. that had the least kind of information structure effects that would have come through an unusual word order or an unusual lexical choice. So as far as we could, we tried to control for them. So next talk is by Cedric. And if Cedric wants to ask the question, he can ask the question and give a talk. Or <laughs> like, uh, uh, he can, uh, we can wrap up and uh, we can move on to your talk. Do you think we can wrap up? So, uh, OK, we will wrap up. And uh, thank you. Uh, uh, one more time. Uh, let's uh, stop the Thank video. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm.